everybody. I always forget to introduce myself. And I'm Ann Kennedy, and I'm a member of the TAILS board. So thank you very much for coming this evening. Before I introduce our guests, I want to uh, thank our sponsors, Nancy and Charlie Mueller, who are not with us this, this evening, but we thank them anyway. And Anonymous whose birthday it is today, so um, happy birthday, Anonymous, whoever you are. I also want to welcome Sarah and Bernie from Titcombs Bookshop. They always are very, very faithful in coming to our programs, and they're going to help, help facilitate the sale of um, Casey's really great book. Um, also, I want to introduce and thank Representative Kip Diggs, who happens to be here with his girlfriend, Tracy. Kip, <laughs> Representative Diggs. We, we, we learned recently that Representative Diggs has secured a, uh, a, a earmark for Tales of Cape Cod in the amount of $25,000 to help us with our accessibility. <laughs> Everybody had a glass of wine? Yes. Y'all primed? <laughs> okay. So I've had a couple myself. So. <laughs> so we are very pleased to have with us once again um, our friend Casey Sherman. Casey Sherman is considered one of America's premier true crime writers. He is a New York Times, US Today, and Wall Street Journal best-selling author of 15 books, including James Patterson. including James Patterson's Last Days at John Lennon, I love that book, um, which spent 16 weeks on the New York Times bestseller list in 2020 and 2021. The Finest Hours, the Cape Cod Maritime Classic, adapted for the 2016 Walt Disney film starring Chris Pine and Casey Affleck, and Boston Strong, adapted into the 2016 CBS Films feature Patriot's Day, starring Mark Wahlberg. He is co-host of the popular true crime podcast, Saints, Sinners, and Serial Killers, which is right up Leslie's alley, <laughs> right? So Sherman is a Cape Cod native and a contributing writer for the New York, for the for Washington Post, Time, Esquire, Boston Magazine, Boston Common, and was a weekly featured columnist for the Boston Herald. Sherman has appeared on more than 100 television programs and networks, <coughs> including Good Morning America, the Today, the Today Show, ABC World News Tonight, CNN, MSNBC, C-SPAN, Fox, Fox, <laughs> I forgot, yeah. and the History Channel, and even The View, I'm sorry to say. <laughs> Story for another day. Yeah, that must have been very interesting. Uh, he is here tonight to discuss his new true crime bestseller, Helltown, the untold story of, this, of serial murder on Cape Cod. Booklist has chosen Helltown as one of its top 10 books of 2022. The Associated Press calls Helltown, quote, an immersive and captivating journey into the mind of a serial killer. I'd like to present a, a little pre preview. Hit it. <laughs> 
<laughs> seamlessly, seamlessly, I move into the <laughs> last part. Please welcome Casey. <laughs> Thank you to Ann uh, Kennedy and uh, the Tales of Cape Cod crew here and my assistant uh, for the evening, Nick Franco, who will be handling the slideshow. I was hoping for that uh, Good, Bad, and the Ugly soundtrack that you guys heard just a few minutes ago <laughs> coming in. Uh, maybe we can bring the lights up just a little bit. Okay. All right, can you guys still see that in the back of me? Okay, great. Um, so, my name is Casey Sherman, and I'm the author of Helltown. And to be quite honest, this is the book I was never going to write. I call myself the accidental author. I never believed that I'd be writing books one day, but that is until I was thrust into the spotlight because of one criminal case, one of the biggest cases in American crime, the case of the Boston Strangler. Now, for me, this was a personal crusade. Because you see, my aunt, 19-year-old Mary Sullivan, a 1962 graduate of Barnstable High School, was the youngest and final victim of that notorious 1960s murder spree. I reinvestigated that case based on doubts that my family had. Those doubts led me to journalism school. Those doubts led me to kind of where I am today. Uh, the first book I ever wrote was a memoir called A Rose for Mary, the hunt for the real Boston Strangler. And it was a personal memoir of how an Irish Catholic family living on C Street in Hyannis can get justice on, on their own terms when nobody really wants to help them. And after the surprise success of that book, I thought, you know what, I can do this. There are other stories that are worth telling. Uh, fortunately for me, there are a lot of great stories, inspirational and dark, here in New England that really haven't been uh, written about or spoken about before. As was mentioned in my uh, introduction, The Finest Hours. So how many people have seen the movie or read the book, The Finest Hours? Thank you. Uh, thanks, Kate. Uh, well, you know, Finest Hours, a little bit like this story, was a story lost to history. It's the greatest uh, small boat rescue in American history. It happened right off the coast of Chatham back in 1952. And um, it was... Uh, pretty popular around 1952 when it happened. It made headlines all around the country, all around the world, and then it was lost to history until 60 years later, I uncovered it along with my co-author, Michael Togas, and we decided to write this incredible valentine to the way we live uh, here on Cape Cod. And it became an international phenomenon. Uh, now it's been read in 86 countries around the world, screened the film in 150 countries around the world, and, and I love it because it's a story that travels. And again, it tells the entire globe a little bit of, you know, our history here on Cape Cod and how we, how we live and how we, you know, are, are, are um, connected to the sea. So I was as far away from a serial murder case at that time in my career as possible. And uh, what led me to Helltown is during the height of the pandemic, I just wanted to get the heck out of the house. So I, I picked up my brother Todd, we got in the car in Hyannis, and we drove the length of the Cape, taking a, a little side trek through every little village, ultimately ending up in Provincetown. Now this was the height of the tourist season in P-Town, and all, all of the stores were shuttered, and it was a ghost town. So we began to talk about the ghosts, real and imagined, in Provincetown, and ultimately we landed on the Tony Costa serial murder case uh, because we were passing uh, a few landmarks that were very uh, important to the investigation of that case. And it piqued my interest enough so that I went back to my office that night and I did a cursory dive into the case because I'd heard about the case growing up in Hyannis, but at that time it was really folklore. And the only time Tony Costa's name would be brought up to me as a kid was on Halloween night. And I was trick-or-treating with my friends. And everybody said, you better watch out. Tony Chop Chop is uh, in the woods and he's going to get you. So it, it became kind of a running joke. And I thought, you know, is this worth my time? Is this worth your time to read? And as I began to, you know, pull that little thread and start to really take a look at this case, 
I was shocked at how vicious this case was. Now, as an investigative journalist, I've covered 50 homicides in my career, including Jack the Ripper, which I re reinvestigated in London with the Metropolitan Police. I've never seen anything this bad. Helltown is worse. So how do I get into a story like that? Was I just going to kind of write a procedural about the killer and, and the victims and what happened? I was looking to elevate the genre of true crime. So I discovered that two writers living on Cape Cod at the same time became darkly obsessed with this murder case. Norman Mailer, who was living in Provincetown, and your old buddy Kurt, who was uh, living right down the street here. So, next one. And when I wrote this story, if you guys read the book, it's, it's a macro story. The landscape in which I paint is 1968 and 1969, when these murders were beginning to unfold. Now, that era kind of reminds me of where we are today in 2022. There are a lot of similarities there. Because in 1969, you know, the summer of love is a distant memory. You know, hope is kind of diminished. They're still reeling. You guys are still reeling from the assassinations of Robert F. Kennedy, Martin Luther King. You've got a bloody protest at the DNC National Convention in Chicago, and you've got Nixon's inauguration. And as you turn the uh, uh, calendar to 1970, you've got Chappaquiddick. You've got the moon landing. Ultimately, you have the Manson murders. And tied into all that are the characters here in Helltown. Next slide. Thank you. So let's talk a little bit about, about your neighbor, Kurt Vonnegut. Um, how many folks here knew Kurt? Well, he lived here. Okay, great. Um, and I, I talked to a lot of people, including my uncle, uh, who was, uh, uh, knew the family very well at the time. And the Kurt you're going to meet in Helltown is not the Kurt Vonnegut we all think about today. You know, the literary icon of the second half of the 20th century. Kurt Vonnegut in 1968 and 1969 is a commercial failure. He's been writing here on Cape Cod for 20 years, and none of his books are in print really anymore. All those classics that we remember reading in school, Cat's Cradle, etc., those are out of print, and he's struggling to support his family, not only his kids, but his, um, his uh, sister's children as well. His sister had uh, passed on, and Kurt um, inherited her kids and raised them right down the street here on Route 6 Day. Uh, he was also a, a struggling car salesman. He had a Saab dealership at what is now called the IT Works or store down the road. It's that uh, stone facade building. That's where Kurt was trying very unsuccessfully for a long time to sell Saabs. But he had a story in his head. And it was a story about his time as a prisoner of war in World War II. And that's a story that really haunted Kurt Vonnegut. He couldn't get it out. He was working on it for years. Ultimately, it becomes Slaughterhouse Five. And now that fictional novel is really the diary of Kurt's younger life, being a survivor of the worst firebombing in uh, Europe during World War II in the German t uh, city of Dresden. And Kurt's job, like many other POWs, was to go out after the dust had settled and to retrieve as many bodies as they could. 25,000 people were killed in those Allied air raids. And Kurtz got visions in his head about this beautiful zoo that was now completely you know, abandoned and all the animals were on the streets, including lions, and they were feasting on the carcasses of victims. How do you wrap your head around that as a young GI? How do you come back here, you know, first to New York and ultimately here to New England and Cape Cod? and still maintain you know, your role as, as a dad and as a, as a uh, provider for your kids. It's very difficult. And he'd been running away from that evil or that destruction or that violence for most of his life. And now he's about to confront evil in his own backyard here in Idyllic Cape Cod. Next slide, Nick. Then we've got Norman Mailer, who is uh, a, the complete opposite of Kurt Vonnegut in 1968-69. Norman Mailer is a household name. Norman Mailer is the heir apparent to Ernest Hemingway, both in his work and his larger-than-life lifestyle. Uh, he had just um, run unsuccessfully for mayor of New York uh, 
and he was coming back to kind of lick his wounds, next slide, Nick, in Provincetown. Now, Provincetown, uh, the name of my book is called Helltown, and that was the nickname given to that spit of land back in the 1700s because that was an enclave for pirates, including a pirate I have become to know very well, uh, Black Sam Bellamy, the captain of the whip. And I'll tell you about my involvement with that case unless you've read about it in a little while. But um, as I said, Helltown was a place where renegades and rogues and pirates felt safe and they could live their uh, life by their own rules. And I think a lot of that still permeates uh, the atmosphere in Provincetown today. You know, I, I don't know about you guys, but every, any, anytime somebody asked me, you know, having grown up on the Cape, and they said, oh, we were in the Cape last summer. I said, well, where were you on the Cape last summer? Oh, just the Cape. I said, well, Provincetown is not like Orleans. Orleans is not like Barnstable. Barnstable is not like Falmouth. Anytime you go to the Cape, if you travel, you'll find a different experience uh, anytime you go. But obviously, Provincetown brings a lot of people from places from around the world, even places as close as Providence, Rhode Island. Next slide. There you go. So these are two young women, Patricia Walsh, Marianne Wysocki. In January 1969, they just want to break away. Uh, Pat is an elementary school teacher teaching uh, at a uh, private school in Providence, Rhode Island. And Marianne is in college. And they've had it with their exams. They're kind of fed up with the uh, Nixon inauguration. They want to travel, but they don't want to travel too far. So they decide, well, you know, we've been to Provincetown a couple times, but we've never really spent a lot of time there. Maybe this weekend we can, we can really find out what this town is, is like. So they take Pat's VW Beetle and they drive it from Providence all the way to uh, Provincetown. Next slide, there you go. And they find this very quaint, idyllic boarding house. Looks innocent on the outside. They visit the landlady. The landlady's got a, a room perfect for them on the top floor, and uh, the landlady also mentions, well, we've got a sweet kid that lives here. He's a handyman. Um, he's knowledgeable about this town. Next slide. His name is Anton Costa. Doesn't he look like a sweet, innocent young man? So Anton Costa, Tony Costa, is uh, somebody that's very intelligent, very, uh, he's, he's great with words, he's charming as hell, and he tells these two young women, I'll take you around to all of the bars in town tonight so you get a feeling of what this place is like. Now that's the old foxhole. Um, it's now I think called the pig and whistle uh, today. So these women, two young women, on the last night of their lives are living their lives. They're playing the jukebox. They're meeting young people. They're having a few drinks, having a few laughs. Next slide. And they're being watched by a killer. Now, when I say that, it's because Tony Costa already has some dark secrets that he is, doesn't want to reveal yet. As a writer and as a journalist, when I jumped into this case, I really had to find all the primary source documentation that I could, which is, you know, it's an amazing thing when items are donated to local libraries. I mean, that, that's where we do all of our work, too. So that's really important for journalists and writers to have that primary source document, do, documentation you know, at our fingertips. And for this book, I had um, access to 3,000 documents, including crime scene photos, autopsy photos. Those images still haunt me to this day. As I mentioned, they're the most brutal serial killings that I've ever seen. To me, I think Tony Costa is the most vicious serial killer in American history. Um, I also had uh, access to the killer's unpublished manuscript that he would write years later. And for the first time, I can take you into those crime scenes directly through the killer's eyes. So who was Tony Costa? Well, doing a deep dive in his background, he wasn't born here in Cape Cod. He was born in Somerville. Uh, his father died in World War II. His dad was a hero. He died saving another sailor's life. So young Tony was brought up by his mother. And young Tony had his mother all to himself until about the time he was five or six years old. And the mother couldn't support this young child on her own. So she met a man. They got married. 
Ultimately, they had a child of their own. But now, Tony Costa has to share her affection and share her love. So he begins to act out. How does he act out? Well, he begins to take a really bizarre um, interest in taxidermy at a young age. In his Somerville neighborhood in uh, like 1965, or 1963 rather, if you had a pet Fluffy, who was a small little miniature poodle, so long to Fluffy, his Fluffy was stuffed under Tony's bed. Now by the time Tony was 16, he graduated to human beings. And he found him, nope, back, Nick, thank you. He found a, uh, a young woman, a teenager, tied her up in her bedroom, and uh, ultimately he got frightened and he left. Well, he was charged with a, a litany of criminal offenses and should have gone away. He should have gone to detention hall. He should have gotten the help that he needed at that age. Because if somebody stepped in with this kid, next slide, these women would be alive today. On the last day of their lives, next slide, uh, they take, this is Pat's VW Beetle, and um, Tony Costa leaves a message on their door at the boarding house. Can you please drive me to Truro tomorrow? Uh, signed Anton Costa. Now what really breaks my heart is that the only crimes committed by those women were crimes of compassion, crimes of kindness. They were doing something kind for a stranger they didn't know. And they paid for it with their lives. Tony Costa did lead them to Truro. And for the beginning of the day, it was a fun trip for these young women because he's pointing out uh, points of interest, historical landmarks. And ultimately, he gets uh, them to an ancient cemetery in Truro. And they're going around and looking at all the unique and grave, grave uh, mark, tombstones and markers, you know, with uh, interesting names like Precious or Thankful. And they're just wondering how these people met their demise. And little did they know that within minutes, they were going to be killed themselves. So Tony Costa lures them out of the cemetery. And he says, you girls want to get high? I've got some marijuana stashed in the woods. And they, they join him. But instead of taking out his marijuana stash, he grabs a knife. He grabs a gun. And he comes back into the clearing, gets in a stance, and fires kill shots toward Pat Walsh. Pat Walsh is hit, and she goes down immediately. She's dead. Marianne Wysocki watched it. She saw her best friend die in front of her. She turned and ran. Tony Costa began firing more shots, but he couldn't hit a moving target. So he grazed her until he got closer and shot her again. Then he put her down on the crusted ground, and that's where he took out his knife. And that's where he began dissection. He began to rob them of their sexuality. That's how depraved this was. Once that was done, he dismembered their bodies and buried them in shallow graves. Next slide. It was a year after two young women went missing from Provincetown. Sidney Monson, who was a graduate of uh, Nosset High School, and Susan Perry, a graduate of Provincetown High School. Unlike Wysocki and Walsh, they knew Tony Costa. They were very friendly with him. Now, when I started to research this story, I found a lot of similarities between the killer we had here in Provincetown and between another killer evolving in California named Charles Manson. And like Manson, Tony Costa also had his disciples, young women and men who were willing and able to commit crimes on their behalf. But what really struck me about this story and what angers me is how disposable women were. Young women like this in 1969. <clears throat> Sydney had been missing for months and nobody cared. Police didn't care. Parents filed a, uh, a missing persons report but never really followed up on it. Susan Perry left and her mother never mentioned it to anybody. You know, well, it was the hippie culture. You know, they jumped on a caravan. They're out at Haight-Ashbury in California or down in Greenwich Village. 
No one seemed to care about these young women. Tony Costa knew where they were. They weren't in Haight-Ashbury, and they weren't in Greenwich Village. They were in Crusted Earth in North Truro. Next slide. Now back to Kurt. Kurt is, is getting his Slaughterhouse Five book finally bound and ready for publication in March of 1969. But he begins to learn about these, these missing young women uh, in Provincetown. And he puts on his crime reporter hat because his training was, like mine, was as a crime reporter and he worked in Chicago. And he was really struck that nobody really cared about these young women. So he was gonna take it upon himself to try to figure out where the evidence would lead in this case. Next slide. Norman Mailer thought the same thing, but his motivations were a little different. Norman Mailer was looking to explore not the violence that existed outside his window, but the violence that existed inside his soul. That's a beautiful picture of Norman and his second wife, Adele. Norman tried to kill her in 1960. Nearly stabbed her to death at a cocktail party uh, while he was running for mayor the first time in New York. Somehow he got a second chance to run for mayor. Norman Mail shouldn't be free in 1969. He was arrested, but Adele never pressed charges against her husband because they had two young children. So he was able to walk. And here he is uh, in Provincetown, but he's learning again about the evil within himself. Next slide, Nick. Thanks. This is actually a, a photo of an experimental film that Norman Mailer made in 1968-69 called uh, Maidenstone. And uh, Maidenstone co-starred Rip Torn. That's Rip Torn right above Norman Mailer. This isn't uh, a, an acted scene from the movie. This is real life. No, Rip Torn tried to kill Norman Mailer on the set of the film. And the cinematographer, P.A. Pennybaker, uh, or D.A. Pennybaker, kept on running the, the camera. And if you Google Rip Torn, Norman Mailer on YouTube, it's the wildest fight you'll ever see. Norman Mailer rips off uh, Rip Torn's ear. And it's all real. But again, Mailer is looking for that external violence that, that he can um, relate to. And that's where he stumbles upon, next slide, Tony Costa. Now again, Tony Costa, he's charming, he's hip, he's well read. He's also been living at that uh, boarding house where the two young women in Providence, uh, from Providence went missing. Well, two detectives begin to sniff around this case. Unlike the Prov Provincetown police and some of the local police here, two Massachusetts state detectives living on the Cape, Tom Gunnery, go back, Tom Gunnery and Bernie Flynn, they take a real interest in this case. And they have their prime suspect right at the beginning. And what I really thought was unique about this case was, and I've covered a lot of these murder cases, this time the killer didn't hide into the darkness. He goaded police. He thought he was smarter than Gunner and Flint. And he leads them on a cat and mouse chase across four states, Massachusetts to Vermont to New York City, and ultimately back to Provincetown. But here's the problem that the investigators face. They don't have the bodies, and they don't have a murder weapon. They have two missing women who may or may not turn up, and some really odd guy that they know is pretty twisted. Next slide. As I mentioned, he is protected also in Provincetown by his, quote unquote, his disciples. They called him Sire. And they began to intimidate witnesses. And they began to uh, withhold evidence from the investigators. They made it nearly impossible for the investigators to do their work. Next slide. So as investigators begin to learn about a possible uh, connection between Tony Costa and the woods of North Truro, they begin to dig in a large area in the Cape Cod National Forest, and they find a body in a shallow grave. Now this is the first mention of that, um, that body. It's in the Boston Globe, uh, early February 1969. This is page 27 of the Boston Globe that day. Now imagine if that happened today. It would be front page with three other accompanying stories. But again, this was, nobody cared 
about you know women on Cape Cod, so let's just bury it in the back of the newspaper. And I think that that was also driven by our economy here on Cape Cod. You know, we're a resort community. You know, we're, we're Patty Page, old Cape Cod. We don't want the darkness to follow you across the bridge. You know, I feel like that, uh, that great scene from Jaws where you've got the mayor saying, the beaches are gonna be open this weekend, folks. It's gonna be beautiful, don't worry about it. And I mention that jokingly, but there's a, there's a serious point to it. When I looked at those autopsy photos, they didn't look like these women had been stabbed. They looked like they had been mauled by a great white shark. Now, as a journalist, you become desensitized to some of that stuff. I couldn't. Writing this book, as you'll read it, I, I really began to know these young women, and I began to care about them. And I, I always thought in the back of my head, and this was crazy, but part of my process, you're gonna get out, you're gonna break free. Don't go into that boarding house, don't do this. Ultimately, I know what, what happens to them. And fortunately, you know, my wife Kristen had to pull me out of that research process a lot, because I was getting too deep and I was getting too dark. Next slide. And there was also a strong element uh, of witchcraft in this case. Not the Wiccans you see in uh, Salem today and you know, the lifestyle being one with the earth. This was, this was dark black magic that was practiced by Tony Costa and practiced by his disciples. Now, one of the archives you have next door at the Sturgis Library are the um, collected articles written by Evelyn Lawson, who is a, a legendary theater critic here in Barnstable. She wrote for the Barnstable Patriot as well. Evelyn Lawson becomes the lead crime reporter for all the Cape Cod newspapers on this story. And she's making the connection right away. There's a coven operating in Provincetown. Now, how does she know this? Well, she used to write screenplays for Vincent Price in Hollywood. She's researched this. She knows it. Everybody thinks she's crazy. She's not really crazy. She's, she's on to something here. Next slide. Because again, you've got this transient lifestyle. A lot of people coming together and willing. They're all looking for a father figure, right? You know, everybody wanted to get away from their parents in 1968, 1969. My parents did. Um, and like Charles Manson on the West Coast, they found that in Tony Costa. Next slide. But again, Tony Costa thought he was smarter than, than the investigators. He wasn't smarter than Bernie Flynn. Bernie Flynn was going down and interviewing the parents of Mary Ann Wysocki and Pat Walsh. And his heart really broke because he had daughters and he had you know, children of his own, as did Tom Gunnery right here. But Tom Gunnery gets a tip from a young uh, Provincetown High School student who survived an attack by the killer. He had taken her into his marijuana patch with a bow and arrow, and he shot her in the back. I was just practicing. I was trying to hit a tree, but I hit your shoulder instead. She didn't notify police. She only notified her mother. But later, somebody uh, told Tom Gunnery what was happening. Tom Gunnery brings her down to this large area in the National Seashore, and they find little bits and pieces of uh, evidence, which you will see. Uh, but they can't find, again, or can't find any, any items beyond that, that body that has nothing to do with Tony Costa. Again, they're putting all the pieces together, but next slide. Tony Costa thinks he's smart, and Tony Costa is writing letters to the police saying that these women are in New York City and that they're alive and well and fine. Next slide. Until that body is identified. And at first they thought it was the body of an older woman because she had been decomposed so badly. Now that body, go back, thank you. That body is Susan Perry. Now they have a link to Costa. Next slide, Nick. Thank you. Then they begin to find the evidence. These are the torn up uh, uh, items that were found in this general area. And they knew, okay, these women are here. They didn't go out west like Tony Costa told us they did. They're here somewhere, so they begin to search. Next slide. And they begin to search a depressed area, much like the Susan Perry um, burial. And they dig, and remember, this is uh, February 1969 or early March, and they're going through very thick crust. 
So somebody grabs a shovel, it's Bernie Flynn and Tom Gunnery in with their hands and trying to bring out as much dirt as they possibly can. And they find a finger. That finger belongs to Marion Wysocki. And they pull her out. She's been stacked like cords of wood in, um, in the grave. And then uh, somebody yells across the clearing, there's another hole here, let's go dig. Do the same thing, that's where they find Pat Walsh. She's cut into two places. They pull her body out. And then they say, you know, something else is into this body. It's the remains of Sidney Monson. So Tony Costa had buried two of his victims together. So at that moment, the chief investigator says, okay, here are the victims. Look at what he did to them. Sorry, I'm in a church right here, but they said, go get that son of a bitch. And they drive right up to Boston. And Tony Costa was hiding at his brother's apartment on Beacon Street. His brother tried to deflect attention, told the police he hadn't seen Tony in days. They didn't believe him. Next slide. They did find him. He went uh, peacefully. They paraded him uh, in front of the cameras. That's Bernie Flynn right there. Now, I spent two years with Tom Gunnery getting his story. And he'd been after me for years to write it. Um, but I didn't get a chance to meet Bernie. Uh, instead, I, Bernie had passed on, so I, I met his wife, Jacqueline. And Jacqueline remembers the, the day that Costa was arrested. Uh, she had watched the news coverage. She had seen her husband. And when Bernie came back to their house uh, in Falmouth that night, she meets him at the threshold of the house. And she reaches her arms out to him. And he pushes her away, almost like an offensive lineman would do. And he says... Don't hug me. I smell like death. That's the trauma that these investigators carried with them for the rest of their lives. Next slide. This is a very defiant Tony Costa being led to his arraignment by, again, Bernie Flynn, who was cleaned up at that point. Um, Costa, once again, thought he was smarter than uh, the investigators, thought he was smarter than um, the DA at the time, uh, Ed Denise. Now, Ed Denise is a curious uh, character in this book because while he's investigating this case and building up the evidence against Tony Costa, Senator Kennedy's Oldsmobile goes off a bridge in Chappaquiddick. Now, Ed Denise has to um, basically handle two major cases. And this, this was, the Costa case was a bonus for Ed Denise because he thought, here's an opportunity for me to elevate my status nationally. He'd watched what Ed Brooke did with the Boston Strangler case. Ed Brooke was the Massachusetts uh, Attorney General at the time, took over the Strangler case, elevated himself to a U.S. Senate seat. Ed Denise thought he could do the same thing. But now he's got to figure out, well, do I, do I prosecute Ted Kennedy on Cape Cod or in Martha's Vineyard? Now, writing this book, I, um, I had to pour over 2,000 grand jury documents in the Chappaquiddick case. And I do dedicate a chapter uh, of my narrative to that particular case because Mary Jo reminds me of Pat and Mary Ann. There are three women that should be alive today. Mary Jo Kopechny didn't drown in that Oldsmobile. She was asphyxiated. She lived for hours with an air pocket. That's all testimony. That's all right there from the divers. Well, Ted Kennedy made his way to Edgartown, slept in a comfortable bed, didn't report the crash until the next day. That's when she died. Again, the idea that women were disposable. Nobody cared about them. Exploited. You know, again, I, I think about my aunt, 19-year-old Mary Sullivan. Somebody had to watch out for her. Somebody should have. Somebody should have watched out for these young women as well. So now you've got the suspect, you've got the bodies, but they still don't have the murder weapons until Tom Gunnery finds them. These are the actual murder weapons. That is the knife which Costa called his pig stabber because he was very interested in murdering police as well. And that is the gun wrapped in plastic. Next slide. This is a uh, photograph from the jury view at the death pits in North Truro. Now just down the street here at the Superior Courthouse one of the most insane 
violent murder trials in American history unfolded in 1970. Now imagine being a juror in 1969, 1970 on the Cape. Well, you may hear a land dispute, you know, somebody breaking in to somebody's store. We're talking about dismemberment. We're talking about beheadings. We're talking about witchcraft. Many of the gallery had to run out screaming because it was too much for them to bear. Next slide. Here's again uh, Kennedy's uh, Oldsmobile. Um, that particular case, uh, Chappaquiddick, ruins Ed Denise's career because he does follow through with a grand jury, but uh, DA has to run for office and his uh, voting bloc are Irish Catholic or Portuguese Catholic. And Ted Kennedy is the, you know, the heir to Camelot. They're, they're not going to follow Denise. He decides he's gonna put all his chips on the table with the Tony Costa case. And during their investigation, next slide, they find, well, there are more bodies out there. Do you think it was just Marianne, Pat, Susan, and Sydney? No, this is Christine Gallant. Christine Gallant was Tony Costa's girlfriend who drowned in a bathtub in New York City. Just so happens he was with her the night before. Just so happens the medical examiner uh, failed to see bruises and marks on her body that were similar to marks on Tony Costa's other victims. Next slide. Tony Costa ultimately does not become smarter than the prosecutors or the investigators. There is a silver lining to the story. He gets convicted, and, but he's still this narcissist who thinks that he's one day going to break free. And he wants to be the biggest celebrity in the United States. Next slide. Until this happens. Charles Manson, just a few months later, begins killing famous people in California. And Costa is outraged. Why? because he knew Charlie Manson. They knew each other in 1967 while both were living in San Francisco. Uh, one woman who uh, lived with Tony Costa at the time, I spoke to her recently and said, we were at a, a several parties on Cole Street where Charles Manson lived and they were in the same room talking. Now who the heck knows what they were saying, uh, but it was really interesting that two evolving psychopaths were, you know, breathing the same air. Next slide. Kurt, back to Kurt and, and Norman. Uh, Kurt writes an expose for Life Magazine, which is still available online today, and he does equate the Costa murders to Jack the Ripper. Norman Mailer will take years to come to grips with the horror of the Costa case, and ultimately he'll fictionalize it in a novel called Tough Guys Don't Dance, which will ultimately uh, be turned into a film uh, shot in Provincetown, directed and written by Mail. If anybody's not seen that movie, you should check it out. You can find it online. It's the worst movie ever made. Um, <laughs> I love Norman Mailer as a writer, but God, this is just horrible. Um, last slide. Okay. Lady in the Dunes, an enduring mystery. Nobody to this day knows who she is. Nobody has claimed her body. Her body was found in the summer of 1974. Could Tony Costa have committed that murder? No. He was at Walpole serving two life sentences because he was only convicted of the murders of Marianne Wysocki and Pat Walsh. He wasn't even prosecuted for Susan Perry's murder or Sidney Monson's murder. Ed Denise wanted a slam dunk, but left their families without any real answers to what really happened to their daughters. So remember I talked about Tony's disciples, young people that were willing to commit crimes in his name. I found it really interesting because again, I had to, all the primary source documents on this case. This young woman wasn't just murdered, she was dismembered. All the earmarks of a Tony Costa murder but Tony Costa was dead at this point. Tony Costa had hanged himself uh, in his jail cell. That's actually, you know, that, that's the popular story. I've heard rumors that he was, he was murdered. I couldn't corroborate that, so I really, I, I didn't put that in the book. But my theory is probably as good as any, that I think that that young woman was killed to appease 
Tony Costa's restless spirit. Next slide. So I mentioned um, Tom Gunnery. Tom Gunnery, again, had been after me for years. You've got to tell my story. You have to tell my story. Put him away. I said, no, I'm not w ready to go there until I did. And I was very um, honored and humbled to work with this hero for two years. Somebody that saved lives. If he didn't find those bodies, if he didn't find those murder weapons, Tony Costa would have been out there killing. Maybe some people in this room wouldn't be here tonight because he was that bloodthirsty. Tom passed away a month and a half ago. Um, but he told me, Casey, thank you for the opportunity to work with you on this because I felt like I was back on the case once more. And he did pass before the book came out, but you know, my book celebration party turned out to be his public memorial. And I wanted his family, there were about 12 to 15 family members there, to understand what an amazing hero this guy was. Not only him, but Bernie Flynn and the rest of the investigators, because you know, my work is dedicated to them. I stand on their shoulders when I write a story like this. The book is also dedicated to the following. Sydney, Susan, Pat, Christine Gallant, Sydney, as I mentioned, Marianne, and countless others who are still out there, never found. Um, you'll know that if you've been paying attention to the news, that this story has come full circle over the summer. That um, uh, about a month ago, friends and family members of the killer began to harass and intimidate a bookseller in Provincetown to cancel events, one that was going to be held for me and another that was being held for another author um, who had written her own memoir about this case. And my, my event was canceled. I didn't know why. I wasn't given an, uh, any reason. But I began to, you know, go down that rabbit hole of those online chats, especially in Provincetown. And then I found out what was happening. You know, they were really putting the heat on this bookseller, viciously eviscerating the female writer for having the gall to write about this piece of dark history. And again, th these, these comments weren't coming from the victim's families, because you, you'd understand that. Now, there was a movie filmed here in Massachusetts in 2022 called The Boston Strangler. It's gonna star Kira Knightley, it comes out next year. Now, I could have reached out to the producer and said, don't you film that here. You know, my, my aunt was killed. I wouldn't do that. You know, I have a right to support or not support that project, I don't have a right to dictate who supports and doesn't support that project. But again, the animosity and the vitriol, the coming from those who continue to protect the serial killer's dark legacy 53 years after the murders. So I got an email a couple days ago from the bookseller in Provincetown. And he says, everybody keeps coming into my bookshop looking for your book. And, and I, I, I hadn't had them. So I just purchased two boxes. Can you drive up to P-Town and sign them? And I did. And I shook his hand. I said, thank you for your courage and your support on this. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Yeah. And, um, you know, I've been fortunate as well that a lot of my work is adapted uh, for Hollywood projects. This one is no different. So before I wrote the book, I had already sold the uh, television rights. Uh, to Robert Downey Jr. He's my production partner on the limited series that we're going to be shooting here on Cape Cod next year. Um, Oscar Isaac is going to be playing Kurt Vonnegut. Nice. Nobody tweet that. It hasn't been announced yet, so please keep that amongst ourselves. Um, but he's also producing the project as well. And again, it's, it's a story about history. Yes, it's dark history, but there is uh, heroism and courage also that you can learn from a very cautionary tale like Helltown. So I appreciate your time tonight coming out and uh, thank you all for your support. Thank you. Good round of applause. <laughs> Once again, thanks to Ann Kennedy and all the folks here at uh, Tales of Cape Cod. Thanks to Nick Franco, who's been doing a, a yeoman's job with the slideshow tonight. Thanks, Nick. <laughs>
Uh, before I sign uh, books, um, I can answer a handful of questions if anybody has them. Yes? Why were people uh, loyal to the killer in Pakistan? Great question. Uh, uh, they circle the wagons around people that live in that community. That's the word I've gotten. Uh, but it's interesting, again, you know, knowing what he did, that's the thing. They knew. You know, all of the grisly details were printed in the paper. It's not like you're defending somebody that may or may not be guilty of a certain crime. Tony Costa was guilty. Tony Costa admitted it. Tony Costa butchered women. How do you defend that? How do you side with that type of darkness? One theory is that some of the people that are out there trying to um, hush up the story are those disciples that may have uh, committed crimes that don't want unearthed 53 years later. So why don't we keep it dead and buried? You know, Tony Costa got a, a Catholic funeral and a Catholic burial. Those women didn't. They were buried in shallow graves. The families never even recognized them when, they, when their bodies got to them. So I have no pity for anybody involved with that because I do think had they not in 1969 intimidated police and witnesses, Maybe Marianne and Pat would have been alive. So, any other questions? Yeah. Are there any specific unsolved cases that are speculated to be other victims of kids? A couple in um, California. A couple of young women that cost the new that just vanished from thin air. Uh, possibly New York as well. Um, not here in Cape Cod, uh, or not that I found. I mean, they're, you know, those woods are vast in the uh, National Forest over there, the National Seashore. So I, I don't know, but uh, at one time, Ed Denise said that there were, you know, 300 missing young women in New England um, while he was investigating this case. Not that Costa did it, but that just goes to show you the, you know, way people were disposable at that time. Yes? So the way you describe the, the way the bodies were mutilated, it sounds similar to the case in the Mouse State in the early 70s, mm -hmm. they did eventually, not that long ago, talk the person. Yeah. Is he a disciple, or is there any connection to this? To There's this no case? connection that I know of. He wasn't a disciple then. He may have been fascinated by the crimes. Um, it was never my intention to glorify Tony Costa. Right. I don't want to do that. But, you, you know, you have this weird subculture of people that, you know, look up to and admire these, these dark human beings. As I said, cast light on the heroes, the investigators, you know, the, the parents of Marianne and Pat who, who filed um, missing person reports. Said, my, my daughter would be at school today. Don't tell me that she's on a caravan somewhere. You know, find her. So my heart breaks for them every day. Yes? Charismatic, very charismatic. Um, you know, women did, couldn't place his dialect. He didn't speak like we speak here on Cape Cod. Um, he had a mid-Atlantic accent that I think he learned watching the movies. You know, people uh, compared him to, you know, uh, Tony Curtis or Cary Grant. And I'm like, well, I can compare him to somebody. Taxidermy, he's got mother issues, he hates his mother. Doesn't that sound like Anthony Perkins from Psycho? <laughs> so, and there's also, um, when analysts began to really spend time with him, uh, they found out that he did have a split personality. Uh, they called it ego splitting then, they still do today, and he was able to blame his murders on an alter ego, on somebody that was living deep within him. Yeah. The uh, place where Tony stayed in the office, is that still there? Oh, it's still there. It's a uh, uh, dentist's office now. But he, was all, he also lived, uh, you know, for months at a time at the Crown and Anchor. Uh, he was a handyman there. So Costa's fingerprints are all over Commercial Street, as are, as are his disciples. And uh, as you'll read in the book, you know, that's where our authors really get freaked out, you know, because some of these young people followed Mailer and Vonnegut around and got under their skin to a degree. Yep. There were rumors years ago that while all this 
body, a woman's body, buried, and she had no hands and feet. And they were, they were insinuating that maybe it was um, what involved her. Yeah. B.S. I wrote a book about Whitey Bulger called Hunting Whitey. I know that case better than anybody. Uh, Whitey Bulger didn't have the stomach for that. You know, his, his uh, what he used to do was let other people kill his victims, and he'd come out and pull out their teeth afterwards. Whitey Bulger spent a lot of time in P-Town, but that wasn't, um, you know, his style at all. And when I wrote Hunting Whitey, which is uh, the story about how he spent all that time on the run, and how the FBI first aided and abetted, and then decided we're going to actually catch this bastard. Um, I had access to all of the FBI case files, uh, 70 letters that Bulger wrote in his own hand, including describing how he was arrested. I also interviewed Whitey Bulger's killer behind bars. Um, it's the only, we're the only journalists, myself and my co-author on that pro project, Dave Wedge, the only journalist that the killer has been corresponding with and he writes us letters from solitary confinement with a rubber tip pencil because they won't give him anything sharp because they're afraid he's going to hit himself or attack somebody else. Um, and just to close, I did mention a little bit about uh, Black Sam Bellamy, uh, the pirate captain of the widow. Um, I'm working with Barry Clifford, and many of you know Barry. He is the uh, explorer who discovered uh, the only authenticated pirate wreck in history in 1984. Uh, with his first mate, John F. Kennedy Jr. And subsequent to that, following that, I should say, uh, they've retrieved $120 million worth of gold and silver from that wreck. Now, when I investigated my aunt's murder in the Strangler case, I actually had to go to the lengths of exhuming her remains for DNA testing. We also exhumed the remains of Albert DeSalvo, the so-called Boston Strangler. I've held his skull in my hands. That's how close you've got to get to these cases. All right, so, so Barry knows this. And a couple of years ago, he goes, Casey, you know, we bring up gold and silver just about every day, but we think we just found the remains of a pirate in this wreck. And it could be the remains of Black Sam Bellamy, the pirate captain himself, who, if you research Black Sam Bellamy, he is the most successful pirate that ever sailed. And he went down with his ship here called the Witter in 1717. So um, I got my DNA folks that worked on the Strangler case to join me for this part of the expedition. And I called my guys down at the University of New Haven and I'm trying to sell them on the project. I said, I don't know how much it's gonna cost. They said, don't worry about it. You sold us at Pirate and Bones. We're up there tomorrow. <laughs> and they extracted a bone. We didn't know if it was an animal. It turned out to be a human femur bone. And they tested it for DNA, and they got a DNA sequence, which is amazing. You know, a 300-year-old bone that's been 30 feet below the surface of the sea, because the Witta pirate wreck isn't something you can dive on. You actually have to dig through 30 feet of soot and sand just to find the timbers and find everything else, which makes it so difficult uh, to dive on. And um, so they have this sequence. But then, well, who does it belong to? Does it belong to Black Sam? How do we find out? So I traveled uh, to England, and I tracked down Sam Bellamy's bloodline descendant in his little hometown of Hiddesley, Devonshire. And I got his DNA in the very chapel where Black Sam Bellamy was christened in 1683, where his mother is buried in an unmarked grave in the back. And we brought it back to the United States. We tested it. It wasn't a match. So who was this pirate? Turns out that this pirate was uh, North African. That was determined through DNA, which was interesting because, you know, the pirate lore that we read and that we see in the Johnny Depp movies isn't true. Real pirates were runaway slaves, mosquito Indians. Um, there was a, an experiment in democracy happening on pirate ships 200 years before they were happening here on dry land. The villains in history were the governments selling human lives. The pirates were only living for themselves. So we have the pirates' DNA. We keep sending that into the global DNA sequence database because 23andMe, everybody is now doing it. We don't know. We might find um, that pirate's uh, you know, long-lost relatives, which would be pretty cool.
But about two months ago, Barry called me again. We found five other pirates now. So now we're going through the DNA testing. And I, I may be back here with Barry a couple months from now <laughs> saying that we found Black Sam. So thank you guys for joining us.